Uh, welcome back to It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. The movie is seven psychopaths, but there's only three of us. What happened to the other four? F the, they fell into a bucket of cream. <laughs> Alright, um, but yeah, hi, uh, It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. I'm one of your hosts, Lugia. I am host other, Patrick. And I am host three... Red drum art. Well, damn, should have done psychopath one too. The ah, it's fine. Just some brief news before we jump right in. Uh, legendary uh, mad contributor Al Jaffe passed away. So rest in peace, Al. He was, and he was, he lived a full life. He was like what, one hundred and two? Yeah. yeah. That is pretty big. Oh, that is absolutely nothing to scoff at. And he's been working on Mad for how long? He basically That's... contributed to every issue up until. 2020 from like 1964 so like 50 years probably damn he was the guy uh mainly known for the fold-ins he was, he was mainly known for the fold-ins i'm gonna be honest i never really did the fold-ins because i was always afraid of ruining the magazine what about well, you guys I would, is I would just like cover my hand over on the middle part so i could like piece together yeah that's that's kind of what i would do too I used to, I used to do it when I got when I first got my subscription to Mad, but then like I'm like, eh, this is this is eh. like I, it, yeah, you'd rather preserve it. I'd rather preserve it. Yeah, I still have my Mad subscription actually. Oh, huh. I know they they don't really make new content anymore. Like yeah. it's mainly just they re still reusing do, old stuff. Just, um, they still do is just like now it's like only like half the magazine, not the entire. yeah, basically, basically. But no, I still I still have my subscription look forward to it every couple of months yeah same i think like the new one just came out a few days ago or something yeah uh rest in peace al thank you for your contributions uh anyway some uh final news that i got is i um saw avatar 2 the way of the water this movie uh i initially like didn't have much interest in because you know i wasn't big on the first avatar but uh you know, got a lot of good press, and you know James Cameron is a very talented director. So I said, "Why not?" And you know what? Um, some people said it was just a retread of the first movie. Uh, I don't get that. I think the entire first third is like so dramatically different, and kind of shifts the rest of the film. The second third does cover some familiar beats, but it's like refreshing with all the tweaks and new context. You know, they give the lead and the villain actual characters. They also actually like, you know, show the villain for more of it. There's a lot more characters because, you know, Jake has a whole family, so they all got their own little arcs. And, uh, yeah, they got a bunch of, like, different relationships to bounce off of, so there's, you know, a lot more meat to latch onto. Uh, the new world they explore is, you know, just as rich as ever. And in my opinion, I think it's more compelling and it looks better than um the last movie. And uh, when the t climax comes around this time, it feels, like, so earned, like it's a real nice payoff to new characters and stuff. You know, Cameron's obviously kind of a master at action and whatnot. Um, really felt like an event, uh, like event formed by its like own context. It's not part of like some legendary franchise like Star Wars. You know, Avatar was light, but obviously doesn't have the same stature as Star Wars. Like when light like, spoiler, yeah. let me ask you something. By the time like the end of the movie came around with that big climax, were you getting Titanic vibes? Yeah, yeah, because uh, the ship was basically sinking. Yeah, I like the the villain was like surprisingly like compelling this time around. You know. Kind of smart and intimidating, but he had that relationship with the spider. So I, I, another, another question: What did you think about the altered frame rate? Um, the version I saw, I believe, had the stable frame rate. Oh, it so did. It, I did not see. Yeah. Wait, right. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't. So you, I assume because you just saw it, you didn't see it in theaters. Yeah. So what, like digital. Mm hmm. All right, because I saw it in theaters, and I'll I'll be I'll be honest. It at the start, it was. Kind of jarring with how smooth it looked, but as the movie went on, it it worked fine. And I think it I think the reason they did that was because a lot of the movie is underwater, and it just looks better with that frame rate underwater. Hmm, that makes sense. I don't know. It just it it kind of worked in the well, end. I understand he actually made the frame rate some variable, as in like sometimes it'd be you know forty eight, sometimes it'd be twenty four, and he would kind of like vary it up depending on the moment. I did not know this. I saw this in IMAX and 3D, so throughout it yeah. looked very smooth. It kind of um, looked, like looked like a video game at certain points. 
Well, IMAX, IMAX in 3D is, I believe, the only... Uh, IMAX was the only one where they made it, like, variable frame rate. They had the kind of locked standard frame rate for the non-3D, non-IMAX stuff. I guess. I don't know. I do not have the perspective of yeah. the other screenings or other formats. I just have the one. One thing I found interesting is that, uh, you know, usually when... um, Because this was made, like, in tandem with the other... uh, th- With the next three. But um, it felt like a satisfying movie on its own. And, like, usually when you make movies like together it kind of def- it definitely feels like like a first part of something bigger you know with like um the matrix 2 and like pirates of the caribbean 2 and whatnot yeah i don't know i feel like the first movie felt like a demo of what the ideas are to come and this one felt like a final draft and i'm actually looking forward to the uh upcoming avatar movies and i'll probably see those in theaters i heard um, the third one is going to have fire navi so yeah i'm just going to assume the title's going to be avatar the flow of fire no, it's called the Seed Bear. The Cool of Ice. I don't know. Love the Avatar titles. Avatar 3 is called The Seed Bear. Um, Avatar 4 is called The Token Rider. It's just crazy to me that Avatar 2 is a thing that has now come to pass. Because, I mean, I've been hearing about this for like a decade. Yeah. yeah. The first and Avatar it's out. When the first, years. When the first Avatar came out, we were in elementary school. And now here we are. And it finally happened. That is Avatar Two crazy. felt like the biggest Avatar joke Man. until it actually for a while. Came yeah, out. it's like yeah. is this actually gonna happen? It kept getting pushed back and pushed back because Cameron said it's. I need the right technology for it. Here it is. Trust his vision. Anyway, uh, seven psychopaths. All right. Take it away, Lugia. Okay, so seven psychopaths was directed by Martin McDowell. Uh, Donna? McDonough. Donna. Donna. Um, okay. Are any of you two uh, familiar with him or his brother's work? No. Um, I, I looked at his Wikipedia page. I recognize some of the movies he's done. I haven't seen them, though. Okay. Uh, yeah, so he basically started out as a, uh, as a playwright, um, directed a few plays. Then he made this short film called Six Shooter. And then eventually he got this film called In Bruges Made. Um, then his brother also made some movies called, uh, The Guard and Cavalry, which have a similar kind of tone and sense of humor. Um, also stars Brendan Gleeson. Brendan Gleeson is in, like, all of his movies except maybe this one? I'm not, I can't remember. Was Brendan Gleeson in this? I don't think he was. Uh, no, he wasn't. Yeah, he's got a very, he's kind of known for his, like, dark comedy style, very dry. Uh, this one's a lot more, like, kind of energetic than his other ones, but, like, it's it still got, like, Somewhat of the essence of his humor. So, he also recently his recent movies were Three Billboards and Banshees of Inisherin. So, you both know, not with, a stranger, uh, not a stranger to award season. Yeah, both got a a bunch of nominations. So, Seven Psychopaths had a budget of fifteen million dollars and made thirty three million dollars, which is all right, decent success, good for him. I don't really have a whole lot of fun facts aside from. Uh, Mickey Rourke was going to play Charlie in the film until he had a falling out with uh, McDonough, and instead he was replaced by Woody Harrelson. That's basically all I got. What is this movie about, anyway? Seven Psychopaths. <laughs> or six, <laughs> well, rather. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean... Okay, so we follow this author at first, right? Yeah, Marty. Yeah, who wants... Marty. I forgot yeah. what was his name. Okay, so this is a real self-insert stuff. Okay. Actually, I said Brendan Gleeson, but actually Colin Farrell's in most of his movies. I should probably mention that. Um, but yeah, so Colin Farrell's the main character. He plays uh, Marty, and uh, he's this um, screenplay. He's his writer. He's uh, wants to write a screenplay. The movie's called Seven Psychopaths. He has a title, but he can't imagine the seven characters. Yeah, he has this friend called Billy who's like this hitman or something he like kidnaps dogs and you know collects rewards for the safe return he has uh he's got a partner in crime called hans whose uh, wife is in cancer and we kind of basically hear throughout his stories about these different killers and they sometimes they kind of intersect paths and stuff christopher Watkins is definitely one is one of them who they like kind of meet if you want to like go in more detail so one of the dogs that billy and hans kidnap belongs to charlie who's the head of uh the mafia and charlie really loves that dog he loves it so much he's gonna kill anybody in his way just so he could get that dog back so the movie is kind of a goose chase between the mafia and 
Marty and Billy and Hans to get the dog back, but also stay alive, which I mean, kind of kind of works out in someone's favor, but I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But um, near the end of the film, so I should probably say this, the first psychopath that you see is uh the jack of diamonds like every psychopath has like this title they they say psychopath number one two three four jack of diamonds is the first one you see but the last one surprisingly is billy who is labeled as psychopath number seven and one because he is the jack of diamonds and he kind of just goes through a joker arc throughout the rest of the movie like he wants a final shootout he wants bloodshed and he also loves that damn dog too is that as far as we're going yeah okay so if you don't mind me just jumping in right now let me ask you guys a question have you ever heard of this movie before i did yeah i've seen it before but you, oh you've seen it before i've seen uh, all of mcdonald's movies okay because uh, here, here, I here's the thing. I remember seeing this movie I, you know, again. No, I didn't see this movie. I remember seeing ads for this movie when it first came out, and you know, the advertisement was presented as a movie about seven crazy people trying to return this dog to this mafia leader. That is what I thought the movie would be. It's not really. It's like it's half. Weird... Like four of them, like aren't even involved in that escapade. No, in fact, uh, the one guy, the guy with the bunny, who we didn't even mention. He's only in, like, one scene. Well, two. He's, he appears at the end, briefly. But no, like, he's, he's like, prominently on the poster. I thought he was going to be, was like, a bigger deal than he was, but no. This movie was very different than what I thought it was going to be, but with that said, I still liked it. Yeah, this was genuinely a good time, aside from a few fucked up moments. Jesus Christ, this movie can get pretty violent. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, seven psychopaths, like, you're, there's probably... You can probably assume there's going to be some blood, but like... You mentioned geez. the bunny guy before, but his fiance was fucking insane. Jesus. Yeah, stabbing the guy in both hands with knives and then lighting him on fire. That kind of gave me uh, somewhat Pulp Fiction vibes. It had like a kind of different sense of humor, but um, it definitely feels like something that was like made after Pulp Fiction. And like that film was definitely like an influence on him. I kind of got um, some Pulp Fiction vibes from this, too. Yeah. A little bit. Random question. Um, so, okay. I haven't seen John Wick, any of them, but I knew the first John Wick is basically he's trying to get his dog back, right? Uh -huh. They killed his dog, and he's getting revenge. Oh. I thought this movie would be kind of like that, but from the perspective of the people who have the dog. But th this movie takes an interesting meta approach. Like, they talk... Like, what they say is... They're kind of controlling the movie as it goes. Because at one point in the middle of the movie, they say, all right, we're going to, all right, in our script, we're going to pull a bait and switch. It's going to be like a bunch of guns and violence in the beginning, and then it's going to be just three guys chilling in the desert. And that's what the movie is for the rest of it. Like, I thought that was a very interesting way to go about it. Because, like, the whole movie is basically like this big bait and switch. Well, Billy's character, too, is a huge bait and switch as well. I think that's what mm -hmm. they were going for. Yeah, I was not expecting any of the screenwriting stuff. Or the meta stuff. I was fully expecting it to be like a cross-country road trip with these seven psychopaths. <laughs> so I guess uh, overall, well, not overall, but like, um, I think this thing that stands out the most, uh, besides obviously the characters, is kind of like the, it's kind of like black sense of humor. Because it's got like a very kind of unique comedic rhythm to it, um, you know, compared to other stuff we've seen at least. Yeah, I guess what did you guys think of that? I think it was like... Yeah, I thought this, I thought this movie was pretty funny. It definitely does have a sense of style. Like, going back to Pulp Fiction, like, this feel... I haven't seen any of uh, McDonough's movies, but it feels kind of Tarantino. Here's a funny thing. Um, I'd say this movie, like, it feels like McDonough, but it, it, McDonough's other movies, but it feels like McDonough's other movies on like, on, like, crack, because, like, his other films have a much more, like, mellow kind of approach to things, where, like, the got this kind of slow more dry sense of humor we're like um you know he'd be like talking on the phone with his boss he's like anyway you gotta kill your partner he's like what <laughs> and like it's kind of it's got a much more um slower I guess more methodical pace to it when this one's like a lot more snappy energetic and somewhat juvenile i guess you can argue what do we think of the performances 
yeah, that said, performances were all pretty strong amongst the main cast. Why do you, why'd you say that like like you weren't sure? Because I'm trying to remember if like I'm trying to remember the other characters. I was like, I, but yeah, no, I I think um, all the performances were good. There wasn't really any that like stood out to me as particularly bad. So oh. yeah. Um, personal, personal favorites would be Christopher Walken, of oh, course. Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course, and Woody Harrelson. Yeah, I'd say Christopher Walken was definitely like the highlight of the film, especially um, near the end. Sam Rockwell was a, uh, you know, pretty good. I'd say it's like Tom Farrell, Sam Rockwell, Woody Harrelson, Christopher Walken. Those are like clearly like the most important characters. Um, and I'd say definitely like Sam Rockwell and Christopher Walken. That the, the, those two like stood out to me the most. Um, some of the side characters are solid too. What Sam? Kind of wish we uh, kind of wish we saw a bit more of the bunny guy, but I mean, I do get in terms of the movie, why he's not really in it. Actually, I do have a question. Um, what was the purpose of the burnt American flag? I... I can't answer that. Remember, uh, Billy said, like, he would... Like, I think I think it was Billy. I'm pretty sure it was Billy. He said he would watch his neighbor's flag for, like, 11 hours a day, and at one point, like, he set it on fire. Why? I forget when that happened in the movie. If it was the latter right. half, I think he just wanted to cause a ruckus. Yeah, I, I, I mean, he is a psychopath, so I guess there is no explanation needed. But I don't know. That's that's still weird because it, it doesn't really tie into anything. It's probably just supposed to be symbolic. The movie does have some subtext about religion and belief. You guys notice that? Yeah, look, you get a lot of those blinds from walking. Yeah, that, and I was like, um, Marty says like he's a pacifist. He doesn't believe in using guns, even like when his like Billy offers him a gun to take just in case. There's an interesting subtext there to look into. I don't really have much to say about it, but you know, it's it's nice food for thought. Yeah. What do you think of cinematography? You know, you mentioned that kind of had this sort of a distinct um, sort of like a very like bright kind of. It was like very bright and sunny, but it felt like it didn't feel bright and sunny. It felt more like you know, kind of, it's kind of grimy. Yeah, it kind of like a dirty feel to it. Um, there's sort of like some sort of a saturation and whatnot where like they really feel like the, the desert and whatnot how i like going back to wild at heart it kind of reminds me of that with a yellow uh tint to it all what did you guys think of the other psychopaths that weren't like a major part of the film like aside from the bunny guy yeah aside from bunny guy um um I was not expecting the girlfriend to be a part of it <laughs> i was like i was when he, when uh, Billy Curly shot Linko? her, I was, like, my jaw literally dropped. Which one, uh, Olga Kurilenko? Or the uh, uh, she was the girlfriend of Woody Harrelson. Oh, okay, different one. I was thinking, yeah. When you said the girlfriend, because, like, wasn't, uh, didn't Sam Rockwell also have, like, a girlfriend? Yeah, but yeah. she wasn't, she wasn't, she wasn't a psychopath, though. Yeah, I know. But, like, she's on the poster, and I was like, that's kind of, like, interesting how they're, like, advertising her like she's one of the psychopaths, but, like, she wasn't. Uh, again, like, Pulp Fiction, Uma Thurman's on, on it, but she's only in the movie for about 30 minutes. Yeah, but Uma Thurman actually has, like, a pretty big part of role in the movie. You know, she's kind of the Fair focus enough. of one of the main segments. I think the standout one was the Vietnamese psychopath. Oh, yeah. Him. And how uh, really? Han That's suggested, like, a change in his character. I thought that was that, really great. That also yeah, ties no, into that, the whole, that was my, that was my the whole belief mind. thing. I couldn't remember if he was, like, Vietnamese or if he was, like... No, he was Vietnamese. Okay, yeah. At the beginning, I wasn't sure if, like, I wasn't sure if he was a real person. Yeah, same not, here. Because, like, they, he's in one scene and he's not really acknowledged for another hour until he's brought up as just a fictional character. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, right, him. <laughs> but no, they they do tie it into everything. And it's actually pretty great. I saw that one scene where um Christopher Walken like uh hears a uh, Colin Farrell story and it was just like that's my life. It was like what the fuck? Like I thought it was kind of funny. Like, who told you this story? <laughs> it actually took me a while to figure out that uh, Walken was one of the psychopaths mentioned in the story. Like, the guy who stalked the uh, the other guy who got out of jail. Yeah, no, I, know, I know what you meant, yeah. One of my favorite moments in the movie is when Christopher Walken is walking out of, is walking out of the desert, and he comes across Woody Harrelson's two henchmen, and like they point their guns at him, and he's like, I'm not going to put my hands up. Why not? I don't feel like it. I don't want to. That's not to. how this works. That's not how this works. Too bad. Like, he's just done. <laughs> I love that moment. That is great. 
Um, okay. Uh, I don't really have any more. Yeah, no, I feel like this is just another one of those movies that we liked it a lot. We <laughs> we don't really have a whole lot to say about it because it was really good. Yeah, I mean, again, like some nice subtext there with the religious stuff. Some interesting, interesting directorial choices with, you know, showcasing the backstory of certain psychopaths. Pretty funny overall. Yeah, it's a solid time. Thumbs up. Recommend. Um, check it out. You know, we got the time. Yes. That's kind of been our streak lately. Movies we like that we don't really know what to say. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we talk a lot about Wild on Heart just because it was so bizarre. But yeah. Well, and David Lynch is a very unique director. I guess. I mean, this guy's a pretty unique director, too. It's just there's not as much to talk about with his style and whatnot. I guess if you like this film, check out Pulp Fiction. It's kind of reminded of Bullet Train given the backstories of the characters and certain directorial yeah, choices. No, it- it How violent like, it is. It felt like Bullet Train. It felt like uh, some of Guy Ritchie's movies, you know, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch. So uh, check out those. And, and, yeah. also, and also Bullet Train is a movie about a bunch of crazy people trying to go after this one thing. You know, this movie, crazy people after one thing. Yeah, so check out those. Yeah. I believe it's your recommendation, Patrick. That it is. Okay, so... We said we've been on a streak of movies we like but don't really know much to say about. I feel like this might be continuing that streak. Or at least I think I was I hoping you would break it. I want a shitty I'm movie, s- damn it. I'm s- I'm sorry. No, this, <laughs> this isn't going to be a shitty movie. In fact, this is something we haven't done in a very long time. Oh. We're going to be looking at a documentary. Oh. That's That's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. When's the last time we did that? Um, Heart of Darkness? Darkness? Yeah, that was a long time ago. That was back during our first season. Yeah. But yeah, no. Um, this is all right. So, this is something I have a lot of interest in. So I feel like I'm going to sustain most of this episode. But I'm just curious. I'm just curious what you guys think about this because I told you in the past. In the past, I've told you I have an interest in abandoned places and stuff like that. We're going to be checking out what is possibly the most famous abandoned theme park in America. Next week, we're heading to Six Flags New Orleans with the documentary Closed for Storm. Ah, okay. You guys know about Six Flags New Orleans? I've heard of it, yeah. I think I saw, like, the Defunct Land do a video on it once. I can't tell. Probably. Actually, speaking of Defunct Land, something to note about this movie is that it was directed by a YouTuber. Oh. Who? YouTube. His channel is Bright Sun Films. Uh, the guy's name is Jake Williams. I, I haven't heard of him. He does, I'll explain in the actual episode, but he does, he does many documentaries on abandoned places. And Six Flags New Orleans is something that always interested him. I don't know. I've just... Six Flags New Orleans is such a fascinating subject to me. I'm just curious what you guys will think of it. No, no, I'm interested. Something new, spice things up a bit. And again, it's been a long time since we talked about a documentary. All right, that was the episode. Um, you have a closer? No.